Um, and we're streaming live. We've, we've, there we go. All right. Good. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Sorry for the delay. And um, public audience, I know we have several things to read into the record tonight. So I'm going to have Jen kick us off with uh, a letter. So Jen, just remember to um, include names and um, addresses for us where you have them. Okay. Uh, Dear Superintendent Curtis, members of the Simsbury Board of Education and First Selectman Wellman, despite the evidence that it is safe, calls from officials to have kids attend school in person, case numbers falling across the state, a lack of proven spread in schools and other high schools in our area going full-time in person, Simsbury High School is still remote three days a week for most students. While this may have made sense as we were transitioning in the fall, and maybe even through the holidays, it's now February. We are asking the district to now provide parents with dates for a proposed return, as well as the criteria that would need to be met to trigger this in-person return. Please consider a full-time four-day return for the high school as is in place for Henry James. Back in September, despite a reopening plan that included the high school returning full-time, the district decided to keep these students hybrid. The full-time date kept getting pushed back as the number of cases in the area climbed. Eventually, the district stopped even trying to provide a full-time date for return and simply just accepted that hybrid was fine. And it is not fine. CDC scientists in a recent JAMA report said that closing schools could affect academic progress, mental health, and access to essential services. And then they cite where that was said, high school students are suffering socially, academically, and emotionally. It is a great disservice to our children to keep them in this model while the evidence proves that it is safe for them to be full-time, especially when we allow the rest of this district to attend a minimum of four days in person per week. High school students are carrying heavy workloads of AP classes and electives and need to make grades to get into college restricting their access to the best possible learning environment is crippling their future and is not fair to them. Seeing your teacher once a week in in person is unacceptable in almost all of the case classes offered at our top rated high school. In addition, the hybrid model has prohibited clubs, groups, and other student organizations from meeting in person, affecting the social emotional health of our teenagers and further handcuffing their college resumes. Students have been unable to participate in person and engage with others in ensembles, plays, clubs, academic groups, groups with like-minded peers, unified activities, and more. Yet the school has found a way to still hold most sports and conditioning programs in person for those interested students. So school social activities matter and are important to teenage students. SHS went from a vibrant, active community to a depressed group of kids on screens. The major developmental task of adolescence is a social one. Cutting our children off from their peers is devastating to them. Schools are now reopening after suicide rates increase. Simsbury does not want to be a line in the next article about teen suicides. Yet keeping the children home three days a week with minimal social opportunity has only one outcome, increased mental health challenges for our children that will stay with them for many years. Studies in the United States and abroad found little evidence schools were spreading COVID-19 infections, showing a path forward to in-person classes. Researchers from the U.S. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, said last week, As many schools have reopened for in-person instruction in some parts of the United States, as well as internationally, school-related cases of COVID-19 have been reported, but there has been little evidence that schools have contributed meaningfully to increased community transmission, the CDC said. We are robbing our high school students of so much in the hybrid model. The four-day model is working at HJMS. And during the PTC meeting at HJMS earlier this month, Mr. Baker said they've acknowledged the teaching and learning is behind where it should be, and they are making adjustments. This is 
with most kids in person four days a week since October. If that's the case in middle school, the same data must carry through, but be for the worse for SHS. If numbers are, con are the concern, is there a way to offer three tiers of attendance at the high school, full in-person four days a week, hybrid and full remote? This could reduce numbers in the building if there are students who prefer to remain hybrid, yet allow students who wish to, to be four days to get more in-person instruction. We would like the district to outline the reasons why the high school is required to stay in hybrid model indefinitely, as well as a timeline and criteria for returning to full time. In the interim, we call for the immediate reinstatement of in-person clubs and activities as you have done with sports. It's simply unacceptable for us to keep in a holding, holding pattern. Thank you. And then it's signed from Brendan Aldrich and Lynn Aldrich, Jody Baker, Claire Barcinelli, Steve Battistoni and Allison Battistoni, Sandra Berger, Noel Bodenberg, Rob Bodenberg, Allison Birch, Lynn Callahan, Glenn Chapman, Andrew Connolly, Shane Daw and Emily Daw, Pamela DiMartino, Hilary DiMaggio, Jed Ton Dobbs and Heath Grossman, Grossman, Hilary Dordling and John Dording, Tara Finn, Justin Fletcher and Michelle Fletcher, Monica George, Veronica and Andrew Grossman, Alyssa Hunter, Lori Slocum Jano, Jano, Carrie Kelly, Eileen Keller, Abby Kelly, Beverly Cole, Shannon Knoll, Stephanie Light, Karen Lafranc, uh, Jocelyn Libros, Pam Lynch, Melanie Marchetti, Todd Myers and Megan Myers, Mike Park and Kristen Park, Julie Pepper and Juan Fain, uh, Christina Pen Pennell and Lyle Pennell, Elizabeth Peterson, and Rita Pritton, Megan Puglis, Denise Raymond, Melissa Richards, and Steve Richards, Alvin and Jasmine Rivera, Ellen Roberts, Lori Savage, Megan Shuck, Bethany Seymour, Emmy, Amy Sheehan, uh, Suki Shergill, Tracy Slattery, Jamie Sternberg, Kelly Strayer and Eric Strayer, Nicole Smith, Aaron Sudby and Heather Sudby, Christine Traficanti and Jim Traficanti, Shannon Vincent Yanino, Jessica Wilmer. And I apologize and for any names I mispronounced. That's the letter. Thanks, Jen, for reading that. And uh, as always, we appreciate your comments. And I think it's just important to note here, we did send a survey out this week to our high school families. So please uh, respond to the survey so we can see what we can do moving forward. Um, Todd, do you want to read the next couple letters, please? I'll read, I'll read both of them. So I have, uh, I have two emails. This first one is, uh, is titled uh, Latimer Lane Capital Project and it is signed by Jenna and Patrick Caulfield. I do not have an address. Okay, and it, it says, Superintendent Curtis and ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Education, as budget season starts, we ask you to prioritize and go forward with the Latimer Lane Elementary School Capital Project. As you are aware, the Latimer Lane building is over 50 years old and has had no significant updates or renovations. The staff has done an amazing job maintaining the facility as best it can, but the building is outdated and does not meet the needs of its student population a student population that is growing and will and likely will pass the building's capacity in the near future. Unfortunately, in addition to being outdated, the building is not fully handicap accessible. We were made fortunate, we were fortunate that my daughter was in first grade when she broke her foot and spent weeks in a wheelchair. Had she been in third grade or above, she would have had to leave the building to go out to, to go to the nurse's office, cafeteria or gym because the two wings of the school are only connected by stairs. 
We know that you must consider many capital projects. The Latin Lane Elementary School project, however, should be the priority because it is the building most in need. Okay. I have another letter um, also about Latimer Lane. This is signed by Christina Bussolini. And again, I don't have the address. And it goes, uh, attention Superintendent Curtis and the BOE. I am writing as a parent of the Latimer Lane Elementary School community to voice my concerns, insights regarding the current structure status of the school. It has been brought to my attention that there have been that there have not been any significant updates within this building in an extremely long time. As this is an almost 60 year old building, I'm hoping that the issues that need addressing would take top priority as you look to organize funds and projects. Also, given the increase in population size over the past few years and seeing that trend continue to grow, Ladmer Lane absolutely needs to be prioritized as, building, as the building reaches maximum capacity. There are also accessibility concerns which then lead to safety measures that without question require structural updates ASAP, such as the K2 wing to 3-6 wing only by use of a staircase. Finally, the Library Media Center is far too small of a space to accommodate all of the students at the school, and it is overwhelmed with books and media center items that make the space an unsafe place to congregate a group of individuals. My ask is simply this. Please take these subjects and add them to the very top of your agenda. I'm truly hoping that bringing, that bringing the attention of these extremely important needs and funding priorities to you will be useful as you organize the upcoming projects for this year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Todd. And Jeff has a couple of letters as well. Yeah, I have two here as well, both on Latimer. First one's from uh, Becky Mahoney from 16 Park Road in Simsbury. It reads, Dear Mr. Curtis and members of the Board of Education, in advance of the upcoming BOE budget meeting, I am writing in support of prioritizing proposed improvements to Ladmer Lane School this year. I was enthused the past two years by the progress the district was making on the capital improvement plan. I followed the reports, attended the public meetings, and spoke before the public audience portion in 2019, emphasizing the crowding that Ladmer Lane was already seeing several years in advance of peak attendance predictions. My understanding is that growth continues to increase at Latimer Lane, which will push the school past maximum capacity in the near future. The population increase combined with the limitations of the current school configuration have resulted in some unfortunate realities at Latimer Lane, such as the library, which is already among the smallest in the district, is currently being used for interventions. The OTPT behavioral coach has been moved to the stage. The PLC PPT room has been moved to the main office. The gym auditorium space is so small that at most concerts, it is standing room only for families to attend and sixth, sixth grade celebration attendance is strictly limited so that there is room for all sixth grade students to have at least one family member there, but no more than two. In addition to the space limitations of Latimer Lane, the building itself is 58 years old. There have been no significant updates since it was built and the existing layout has some very significant flaws. For example, the only way that grades three through six, the only, the only way that the grade three through six wing of the school is accessible to those in wheelchairs or otherwise limited in mobility is by going outside from the far end of the K2 wing since the connecting hallway has a staircase in the middle of it. I realize that this is an infamous talking point. However, I have seen firsthand how this configuration thwarts students in wheelchairs and sometimes on crutches. To me, these conditions do not meet the expectations of a community that prides itself on providing an exemplary educational experience for its children. They reflect a choice to, uh, to ignore the value of investing in our school building. While the capital project list needs to be prioritized, Latimer is clearly the building most in need, and I would like to see a vote on this project this year. Sincerely, Becky Mahoney. The second one is from Teresa Berry, and, and I don't have a, uh, an address on it, but here, here goes. Hello, Mr. Curtis. I realize that this last year has been a very challenging year to be a school administrator. I sincerely appreciate all that you and the district have done to allow our kids to safely be in-person learning. 
I'm so proud of how well our district has done and I'm beyond grateful my kids are able to have that important social interaction with their peers. I'm writing to ask you and the board to prioritize the Ladmer Lane Elementary School Capital Project. While this school is an amazing place for kids to learn, it is not because of the structure facility. The educators, principal, and all staff are wonderful. Our children are so lucky to have all of them. However, our kids are learning in a building that is sorely outdated and can no longer fit the growing population. The enrollment has increased drastically over the last few years so that population has outgrown the space. They have been very creative in finding classrooms, but the problem will only continue to increase. The common spaces are far too small to accommodate group events, which hopefully will begin, hope, I'm sorry, hope, which hopefully we will be able to be, have again soon. The media center is tiny and beyond outdated in structure. Mrs. Bergenti does an amazing job bringing in new books and exciting STEM learning tools and other technology, but the physical space is inadequate. Please consider prioritizing Latimer Lane improvements as part of the overall capital project. Our school has been significantly impacted by the increase in housing developments in our district. The population will continue to grow and these children and educators all deserve a wonderful building in which to learn. Thank you for your consideration, Teresa Barron. And then I have one more that um, I did not pass on. Uh, this, this letter is from Lizzie Given, 14 Woodhaven Drive here in Simsbury. And um, she writes, hi, Mr. Curtis. I think you know I have a Finley, third grader at Latimer Lane, a soon to be, and soon to be Felix incoming kinder. Then after that, a Tatum, most bananas and sleeping, and I wanted to write to you on behalf of my small crew and other small crews in the Latimer community. My hope is that I can continue to encourage you to keep the Latimer facility on the top of your mind as you move forward with large scale plans. With a growing Latimer community, we really need some immediate support regarding the facility and spaces. I know you will be receiving letters from others, so I will hone in on my personal main concern, which is the significant growth in population that we have seen over the past few years. The classrooms are already packed and the main spaces themselves, library and media center, simply can't handle the growth in bodies. I know you have been in Latimer a million times and this is not new information. Again, just a nudge to hopefully see changes sooner rather than later. I love the Simsbury community. I have friends all over with young families at a variety of schools and I completely believe in a plan that works for all schools. However, I do feel that Latimer should be at the top of the list in an immediate sense simply because I think the building needs it. I realize I am asking for big things, so please let me know if I can be of any assistance. I am really great at rallying the troops and I have an American Ninja Warrior megaphone. We appreciate you seriously. Thank you, Lizzie Gibbon. Okay, so um, we appreciate all the public comment and remind everybody that they can always submit it through uh, an email. Um, with that said, we're moving forward into board and administrative communications and committee reports. So, um, Jen, do you have anything to add tonight? I do not. Okay. Tara? We had a great curriculum meeting last week, I have to say, um, and I think we had a full subcommittee there. We had Jen and Jeff and Lydia and myself, and we were, um, we had, uh, as far as our staff, we had Sue Lemke ran it, and we had um, Melanie Meehan, Georgia Roberts, and Betsy Gonzalez all there um, helping support the information that they were sharing. Um, the primary uh, focus of the beginning of the meeting was Black History Month, and how um, our schools are are doing thing with it and what they are sharing with their students and what their students are learning and doing. Um, and there was some really very cool stuff. The old days of being able to decorate your door or your room and then have a parade through the elementary schools are not available to them this year. So they had to be a little more creative and um, they're doing a lot of digital stuff. So a lot of these, uh, we learned about a class, a third grade, that was doing um, videos and they are creating basically virtual museums. And each of these kids are putting up slides and they're videotaping them. And it's like the book report on um, black Americans across all contents. And 
you know, we're trying to, I think we've, we've finally learned our lesson and it's not about athletes and musicians. It's about actually people who make big differences in our world and our communities. Um, and so they're learning an awful lot about a lot of different people. Um, I know one kid was very excited to learn about Amanda, to learn more about Amanda Gorman after her speech at the at the inauguration, which was really exciting because she's so young and it's nice to see young people learning more about young people. Um, we also uh, Tuton Hills is sharing quotes through morning announcements. Each class picks a day and they get to pick their viewers and school. We got Latimer's reading books about uh, figures over the loudspeaker. James show quotes, quotes um, about displaying good character at our school every day. They're doing a scavenger hunt around the school where you can win prizes. Um, so that's pretty good. We also have a guest, Dr. Alvin Johnson is coming to speak to the school, which I think will be very cool. Um, Henry James, the Students of Color Alliance is helping coordinate um, announcements over the loudspeaker, virtual social events. And on Wednesday and Thursday, they are doing things in person as well. So it was nice to hear that all the schools are represented and they are, they are embracing Black History Month. And um, I'm looking forward to Sue promised to show us some of the virtual museums, because I think that that's, I'd like to see some of this work once the students finish it, because it, it looked really exciting. Um, I'm sure everyone else might have something to say. The other thing that we talked about at our meeting was, um, exciting classes that we're looking at doing um, pilots of next year and um, they're both uh, computer science and they have minimal costs because we already have the teacher in place and the um, equipment in place to move forward with them we will just have a slight cost for developing the content um, one is a continuation of the initial computer science class and it is going to take you to python which is uh, the logical thought sequencing and algorithms things. Um, so that's very cool. And I think there's a lot of students in a lot of different categories who would really be able to embrace that. We also are going to put a class together for uh, cryptology, uh, cybersecurity and photography kind of, and that's a, you can take it right out of the box. It's a open to all students. So those were two exciting things that are moving forward. Matt Milch, the head of the math department is setting those up. I don't know um, who else was at the meeting. Jeff, Lydia, Jen, do you guys have anything that you'd like to add to that? Not here. I, I thought it was a great report. And just seeing what all the state, the all the schools are doing um, was really, really encouraging. And I really love, as you alluded to earlier, that we're we're not focusing on the three or four individuals uh, that we traditionally have. That's obviously something we heard loud and clear at the symposium, uh, gosh, going on two years ago now, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it's just nice to see all this sort of coming to fruition a little bit. Yeah, I would love to see um, us share some of those videos at the board level, Sue, if we could do that, that'd be great. I would be happy to. Terrific. Um, Brian, do you have anything for us tonight? Nothing tonight, Sue. Okay, thanks. Todd? Nothing tonight. Okay. Uh, Jeff? N nothing tonight, thanks. Okay. Sharon? Yep, I do. Um, Tara, who did you say Dr. Al is Alvan Johnson is going to be with school? He's coming to Henry James. Sue will have to give you more info on the details. Okay. Nope. That's all I need. Thank you. So um, a couple of things. One is um, I've been, I don't know if most of you know, but I am on the diversity committee with CABE. And so um, there are a couple of things that are going to be coming out. One is we are putting together um, affinity groups. And um, so there'll be more information coming out about that. Um, looking for potentially um, board members to join um, affinity groups. Um, we're just gathering um, information about that. So, um, and the purpose of the affinity groups would be just to have a place for board members to come to share information. Um, one of the things I think, and I was um, part of those discussions is, we come together annually at meetings and that's the only time that we do. 
Um, but off cycle, you know, things come up and you need to have a place where you can come and share ideas and talk to one another. And CAVE annual meetings shouldn't be the only time that we talk to one another. And so that would be a forum off cycle for us to do that. Um, and so that's one thing. And then the other um, is that we are also looking to, that was one forum was a, another thing that we're looking is to try to collect race and ethnicity information across um, the boards. So I think some of that information has been talked about, I think, um, but if it hasn't, it should be coming up again. All right. Great. Um, and then I think that's, I think that's it for me for right now. All right, well, let us know if you need some support. We'll do. Lynn. Um, yeah. So just a, a few quick things. Tomorrow is the NSBA Equity Symposium. If you haven't uh, had a chance to register, please do. Um, if you register by tomorrow and you cannot attend, you can um, watch the a recording at a later date, but you must register for this in order to watch the recording. So far, we have over 2,000 attendees um, attending tomorrow. It starts at 1 and will end at uh and at, uh, and at five. So it really will be quite, uh, it's the third year in the row, the fourth year in a row that we are doing this. So um, it is um, gaining momentum in attendees. On Thursday morning is the Hassa Cave and Crack Legislative Forum. So that will be 8.30 to 9.30. And uh, I just got a, uh, an email from um, Senator Whitcoast's office that we, he will be attending. So it is open to all superintendents and board members and um, and uh, legislators. So we do hope to have a, uh, a good uh, a showing with that. And then at Thursday, the governor's budget will be unveiled tomorrow, Thursday at 11 K we'll be having a recap of the governor's budget. So if you're able to register for this webinar, um, I encourage you to do so also. It's free for this one and it's just about an hour. And about the legislative updates now is that we're moving into legislative season in, uh, in Connecticut. So a lot of the uh, legislators are having difficulty conducting their meetings. They're all in Zoom um, and, and some of them are, are still, you know, hitting mute buttons and unable to really able to, uh, to, to have successful meetings as, as, as we have succeeded in, in boards of education. So everything is virtual um, and there are some struggles with some of the meetings and technology. So unfortunately, they don't have informal conversations in person, live conversations there at the Capitol. So this is getting to be an adjustment or an adjustment for them as, as we move into, into as, we're, as we in the session. And as you know, this year we have to adopt the two year budget. So some of the um, raised bills or the proposals that they're considering and uh, that will be coming forward will be the MMR vaccine bill, the religious exemption, vaccine. And uh, this year, they're opening it up for 24 straight hours for hearings. So you could be anywhere in the country and you could still log on to give a testimony regarding the exemption. So um, it's this is the longest hearing time that's ever been and it will be virtual. But uh, this is the only one that will be for this length of time for this particular bill. Some of the other proposals to be considered um, will be the Native American students, which will be uh, um, of a study as part of the social studies bill. The same goes for the Asian Pacific studies as part of the social studies bill. The other, another one will be the feminine, feminine hygiene bill products. And uh, as you've heard about that, about uh, having them um, in the middle schools and high schools. Another one is about the no prohibition, no, no prohibition policy for natural hair. That is something that is going to be coming up. There's been a lot of uh, discussion on that. The climate change is in the social studies curriculum. Um, another one is digital learning, media literacy by grade three. Another one is, uh, which you read in the um, media, is the encouraging of the regional efforts. And uh, this, uh, this applies for school districts under 25 populations under 25,000 and 20% uh, 20% reduced um, cost for school construction. And some of the others that will be coming back again are the early childhood and uh, minority teacher recruitment and retention. And then of course the 
commitment to move forward the ECS, and, and that's been on the books on the docket 20, since 2017. So some of the other um, districts or, or regions have had very successful legislative breakfast, so we are at the tail end of having, having the one here for our uh, Hartford region. So, um, so hopefully we'll have some discussion with that when we meet on Thursday. So that's, that's it. Thanks, Sid. Uh, the NSBA conference, I did register, but wondering, um, can you log in late? Is that an issue? Yes. Um, yeah. It, so yes, as long as you registered, you can, you can log on for any pieces of the time, knowing that right. not everybody can be there for that whole entire time. But, um, you know, we will have uh, keynote addresses and, and by some speakers and, and remarks. Yeah. And then we will also have this year that uh, we'll be have the NS, NSBA um, Dyer team dismantling institutional racism um, and equity. And there will be a very big presentation from um, our council leaders. As you know, in NSBA, we have uh, four very active councils. We have Council of Urban Boards of Education. We have National Hispanic Council. Um, we have National Black Council and uh, American Indian um, Native American Indian Native Alaskan Council. So we will be having some great presentations on that. Um, we'll have a student presentation. So there's a number of things that will be that will be um, offered this year, even though virtually. So thank you, ma'am. Um, Catherine and Shannon, I'm, I'm glad to see you both on our meeting. I'm not sure who's got a report tonight, if you both have a piece of it. So I'll let that, leave that to you to unmute. Yeah, I'm taking over for the rest of the year. So I have a quick update on some of the schools. So Latimer Lane had their first virtual bingo night, which was attended by 90 families. And it was an awesome evening of family fun and a great way of bringing the in-person and distance learning families together. Um, as mentioned earlier, all the elementary schools have been celebrating. Um, Black History Month and Tootin Hill specifically, each class has been studying the accomplishments and contrib contributions of important Black Americans, and they've been like creating those museums. Um, Tootin Hill's also had a Super Bowl fundraiser and Spirit Week, where they collected 644 items for donation to the Simsbury Food Pantry, and they predicted that Kansas City Chiefs would win, and while they were wrong on that prediction, the overwhelming support for the food drive was a victory for sure. Um, they also celebrated the 100th day of school, and the library's media specialists from the five elementary schools have partnered together to create the SPS Family Reads program. And each month, the library media specialists will recommend books from their school libraries for families to share together. Families can then go to their student's destiny discover account, find the, find the title, and read it online. Um, and this will help the families to learn together, enjoy meaningful conversations, and provide a sense of consistency and shared togetherness in this stressful and troubling time. Um, Terraville has also been celebrating Black History Month like the other elementary schools, and each grade classroom is participating in the creation of a book museum. Um, and that's basically it. Everything is running smoothly at Henry James in the high school and everyone is continuing to follow all the COVID protocols and it's going well. You're all managing okay up there, huh? Good, glad to hear it. Um, so let me say we've got uh, six Great, just want to remind the board that this Friday is an early release day for the purpose of professional development in the afternoon. And uh, from elementary school to high school, a variety of topics and focus areas uh, regarding social emotional learning, equity and access and engaging instructional strategies. So a lot being offered. We appreciate that time to further develop our practice here in the Simsbury Public Schools. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, just wanted to um, thank you for mentioning our survey for our high school families that closes on Friday so that we can know um, what their um, wishes are in terms of 
potentially increasing the capacity for in-person learning. I did want the board to be aware that we're seeing um, a few more families at the elementary level who have been in distance learning express an interest in changing their learning mode to perhaps come back in person. Uh, I'm working with Betsy Gonzalez and the um, various elementary principals on that, um, trying to um, actually identify certain dates when we would move um, students back if that is the desire of their families, because we may need um, in some cases some time to make sure that all of our um, safety COVID related protocols are in place the way we need them to be um, before we bring back a few more students. So it's right now it's been a manageable process and we'll watch what happens over the course of uh, the rest of February and March here as um, those requests come in. That's what I was going to ask you about accommodating space wise for students who wish to make that change. That's that's really going to be your first consideration, I would imagine. OK, uh, Ms. Amy. All set for tonight. Thank you, Sue. OK, and Mr. Curtis. Um, I would just add, you know, with Neil's COVID update that we continue to be encouraged the last two kind of weeks, two reporting cycles in particular with both the state trends. Uh, but more importantly, the Farmington Valley and the Simsbury trends. So it was just January 30th that actually the Simsbury committee, uh, community reached its peak in cases per 100,000. And in the two weeks since then, we've seen a significant uh, decline in case numbers in the community. Uh, and that's corresponded with what we've seen in the schools. So uh, we are encouraged by that. So the, the timing is right to have the conversation relative to uh, expanding enrollment at Simsbury High School. So as Neil said, uh, the responses to the survey are important. Uh, I took a look this afternoon. Um, clearly, there is a, a significant interest in getting students back uh, four days a week from the early returns on the survey, and we've gotten about 600 responses already. So um, just Great. continuing to get that data in will be important for us uh, and our team to meet on that and then subsequently pull in the Farmington Valley Health District. So top priority that we have going on. Uh, other than that, we've been very busy as a board with the workshop. Uh, in, our, in our work on budget, and you're going to hear plenty from me on that tonight. So that's um, that's all I have for now. Great, thank you. And uh, so with that, we're going to move into recommended actions. Uh, appointment of Director of Pupil Services. Okay, so that one's going to come my way. And I'm really excited. I know we have Katie Crisula has joined us this evening. So welcome, Katie. Um, to request that the board appoint Katie Crisula to the position of Director of Pupil Services um, for our school district. And this really uh, is an important piece of our overall uh, restructure that we've spent a considerable amount of time talking about. And I know that the board had an opportunity uh, to interview Katie a week ago and came away uh, very impressed with not only her understanding of the work of special education from both the student perspective and the teacher perspective in Simsbury, but uh, of her vision for the department and how she articulated that vision. Uh, Katie is, is uh, relationship first uh, and has done a great job in forging those relationships in our district. Uh, and I know that she'll continue to keep that as a, a significant priority. Um, she's been with us four or five years as a department supervisor at Simsbury High School, doing great work with the high school team. And this year uh, has expanded that role to 712 on an interim basis and allowed her to really get more involved with at the middle school level and work with us as an administrative council. And certainly we've been, our team's been incredibly uh, impressed and know that we have a wonderful internal candidate here that's gonna work closely with Sue and work closely with myself as we move forward uh, work that I know we all value, which is the work of special education in, in Simsbury. So uh, with that, I would uh, ask the board to consider uh, the motion that's on the board. All right, can I ask somebody to make the motion, please? I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion. I'll move that the Board of Education appoint Catherine Crisula to the position of Director of Pupil Services with an effective date to be determined. I'll second. Uh, all those, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Katie, congratulations. I don't know if you want to say a couple words. Yeah, Susan, I'd love to. Um, I just want to thank the board for this opportunity um, and Mr. Curtis as well. I am just so excited to continue my journey to support our district's learners um, by working with our wonderful families in the community and um, our outstanding teachers. Um, and I just can't wait to get started. So thank you so much. We're happy to have you in this Katie. position. We're all excited. Thanks, Katie. All right, that's a good way to start the meeting. Um, now we're on to approval of minutes, January 26th meeting. Can I get a motion, please? I'll make a motion. So moved. Tara. All right, Katie, so it sounds like we got Tara and Jeff. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Do you want us to raise our hands again like we did last time? Well, I, we could, the problem is I think not everybody's on the screen. So if you could give us a verbal, just unmute yourselves. You can always use your space bar for a quick unmute. That might put the screen on gallery. Um, I believe motion carries. Uh, the approval of the February 2nd special meeting minutes. So moved. Aaron. I'll second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. And now we're on to the adoption of the six year plan. Thank you, Susan. I'll, I'll kick that one off and then I'm going to turn it over to Neil for a few minutes, who's uh, we've put together some information to share. So we had a really great conversation um, throughout the budget process about our capital improvement plan, the six year plan and how we're trying to incorporate our long term vision of revitalizing our elementary schools with current maintenance needs. And I think we've we've done a solid job of, of tapering this down and prioritizing things. Our last conversation at the workshop was a productive one, and it involved um, the conversation of a joint project of Latimer Lane School and Henry James, and the potential of decoupling that project so that we had a clear um, number one priority in Latimer Lane, and that we would move Henry James um, a few years into the six-year capital plan. And that's the decision we made at that workshop, we wanted to present that information a little more formally to you tonight and for the public as uh, we have it on the docket to approve the six-year plan. Um, as we said, in decoupling this plan, uh, there's a bit of an increased cost to Latimer. So Neil wants to walk through that piece um, and has some other important information about you know, what it means to engage in a project of this scope and renovate as new and what that looks like. So. Um, Neil, I hope that tees it up for you and, and I'll pass the baton your way here. Yep, that's perfect. So um, really just um, a few quick slides here with the help of um, our partners at Tecton. So Jeff Wazinski has been uh, continued to be a great partner in helping to support our work in moving through the long-term facilities plan. The first slide we're showing you tonight is to talk about the cost estimate to um, move this um, first year of the capital improvement plan with a Latimer Lane uh, renovate as new project. It's a very detailed slide that the people from the facilities and enrollment uh, meetings would be used to seeing. I'm going to focus on a macro level. Obviously, with the original plan to do Latimer Lane and sixth grade wing at Henry James at the same time, um, any decision to decouple that um, would be uh, important to go back and look at what we're doing at Latimer Lane because you change the project from what would be planned to be a K through five school to at least temporarily need to be a K through six school. So with the arrow that points to number two on this slide, um, what you can see is that square footage is accounted for in this new estimate to say 
that you could account for rooms that would tempor temporarily be sixth grade and that you could plan um, if, if and when sixth grade moves to Henry James, uh, which is the direction that this board has supported, that they could, um, that space could be converted to pre-K rooms. We know from our neighborhood meetings that the concept of pre-K in more buildings than Squadron Line, which is where it currently is, was very popular. So, you know, this is sort of in the spirit of the long range plan as well. Um, and it changes the price tag. The, the price tag that we have been dealing with as a board throughout the drafts of our um, six year capital improvement plan was a total project cost of thir about $34.5 million. You could see at the bottom of this slide that um, that extra space would require this to go to roughly $36.8 million. That's a, an increase of $2.3 million. Um, after reimbursement costs, that increase would be a cost of 1.5 million cost to the town. Um, and that's kind of the price of, of doing business to decouple. But obviously the strategy of decoupling is that it's at the direction of the Board of Finance trying to look to structure the debt long term, that if you don't do both of these projects together, being able to structure the debt in a way that keeps under their debt threshold um, would be an important goal in separating the project. So I definitely wanted to show you that slide since the number changed um, over the course of our original drafts. The, the next slide would then show you kind of, and the public, I think it's important for the public to understand, what do you get when you talk about a, a, a project like that in the, in the um, $36 million range for Latimer Lane? Um, it's, you know, we use the phrase renovate as new. Um, you, you would certainly do your due diligence to look at the feasibility of a new building. But typically, if you have a structure, the state's going to recommend that you look at a renovate as new, um, which is to give the, the facility really its next generation of a, of a lifespan. Um, importantly, at Latimer in, in um, bullet number two there, to address the significant capacity issues that our demographics are showing are causing the most stress at Latimer Lane of any of our five elementary schools, but also to, to address the educational space needs. Um, um, to certainly uh, under number three there, to take what is a very dated facility and, and turn it into flexible, innovative space and um, address uh, you know, sort of the learning for the future and the kind of spaces that would um, invite more innovative learning um, in an elementary school. And number four, some of the letters that the board received earlier tonight about some of the existing conditions, certainly the ADA compliance issues, um, some, of, some of the other code issues. Uh, and importantly, what number four does, as the board knows, our long-term plan for, from Tecton involved significant maintenance projects at each of the buildings. And when you do a renovate as new, um, it, it eliminates all the maintenance items that would come under Latimer Lane because you would take care of them in this kind of renovate as new project. Um, the next slide takes this to a little bit more um, specificity in terms of what uh, renovate as new means in terms of different aspects of not only the site, but also the architecture. So certainly on the site, there's a lot of ADA compliance gains that happen, not only with your playground areas. Um, uh, you know, I know the architects um, have pretty significant concerns about drop off and par uh, uh, pick up areas at Latimer Lane School for both buses and cars. Um, being able to address those with a rethought site plan and certainly security concerns. Um, on the exterior, um, talking about those maintenance projects, one of the significant costs that um, if we didn't do anything to Latimer Lane, the, the 
windows and door projects alone have significant price tags. Um, and that exterior architecture is um, a significant need that would be met. Under interior architecture, not only are you revamping the core of the facility, meaning um, the, the gyms and libraries and cafeterias and large public spaces, but you're also identifying specialized spaces and um, modernizing the classrooms. I will note that what renovate as new means from a state um, code standpoint is that you um, maintain about 55% of the current structure. That's what the code calls for. And then you can, and typically they will try to work with the core facilities, um, maintain at least 55% and then um, you know, demolish and rebuild other portions of the building so that what you're at at the end of the day is truly um, as new is as it's advertised. It's as if it's a new building. And then lastly, on this slide, certainly the building systems, um, some of the uh, fire and HVAC systems. I will note, look closely in the second line at the bottom there. It does include air conditioning throughout the building. When you do um, renovate as new projects now, you are required to do air conditioning throughout the building. Um, and certainly this is another place where we would gain some of the um, energy efficiency, green energy um, gains in doing a project such as this. And then the last slide I have for you tonight is just a, um, what would now be sort of a revised uh, capital improvement plan based on our long-term study, which is to take that highlighted um, portion on the left and say that the clear first priority is renovate as new at Latimer Lane temporarily as a K-6, but then to really think about it as a K-5 if and when we move to step two, which is to um, add the sixth grade addition at Henry James. Right now, when we go to look at your um, proposed six year capital improvement plan, we have placed that step two in year four of your plan. That price tag has not changed. Uh, and then the other priorities beyond um, Latimer Lane and a sixth grade addition at Henry James um, in priority order would be um, the second most stressed elementary school which is Squadron Line School, and then um, Tooten Hills after that. So that is um, where we stand here on February 9th. And I know it's been a long process to get here and I'm sure board members have um, some comments to make. So I'll open it up to everybody. If you have questions for Neil. Um, Neil, I'm just, first of all, it's HJMS. So the extra M has been bugging us a little bit. I, I was I the only one who noticed that. I was, I was unable to change Mr. Wazinski's slide. I think he, I, he, I think he thinks it may be Henry James Memorial Middle School. Oh, I was well, unable it, to, I, it was bugging me too and I couldn't alter it, I'm sorry. Um, but my other thought is, my other comment is, um, this is our current, long range plan, but it could change. I mean, nothing's in, I mean, right now we're really focusing on Latimer Lane and those step two, three, and four are not anywhere near in stone or have been voted on for any reason, or they're just a way to play, be a placekeeper for what we saw as need, right? Absolutely correct. It, it, it takes the long-term study and identifies the most significant needs, but there's certainly not, um, you know, concrete steps to, to what would happen after this step one. And Tara, that, that's a great point just to jump in. And you know, on an annual basis, we have an opportunity to revisit that year one in collaboration with the other boards and make shifts that we may feel necessary based on different trends or challenges that may come up. And every time we look at this stuff, we also have to make sure everyone who's watching understands that, that we, we aren't assuming this is easy and we aren't assuming that there's money there it's just it's it's what we see as need as a priority for need for our students and um the rest of it has to be discussed with the other boards and as we move forward and with the community at large 
It's my opinion. I, I, could be I don't think you're wrong. Does anybody else have questions or comments they want to make before we move to a motion? This is Jeff. I would just say this, this looks, and thanks Neil for, for laying this out. Matt, all, all your guys work um, on this. Obviously we see, we see probably one tenth of all the work that you guys are doing on this. So just greatly appreciate the time and effort. It, you know, this, this seems like a very reasonable path forward and a very responsible path forward. Um, so I hope you could support it as a board. You know, it addresses the immediate need that we have and we've been studying for years uh, at Latimer Lane. Um, but it does take into account the realities of today, right? You know, of COVID and the financial challenges that this town has. You know, and if we delay uh, moving the sixth grade to, to Henry James for a few years, that, that's fine. We, we have supported that move as a board. And if we just delay that decision, you know, that's fine. And again, I think it's a, it's a very responsible uh, strategy on our part. So uh, again, just appreciate all the work and hopefully we can keep pushing this forward. Well, and I think it's important to note that part of the facilities conversation talked about spreading out the pre-K, mm -hmm. using the, that classroom space now to accommodate the sixth grade until we're in a better position to make that move financially as a community. Um, I think that makes such good sense mm -hmm. because the space will be there for the pre-K to be spread out as we yep. move forward. Um, anybody else have comments? Okay. Um, is there, are, are there any other slides with the capital map? Do we, I, I just don't want, um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that on page two, we did have the two other projects there. We don't have any other slides. It's, okay. um, you know, we've talked about that year one, which is the um, bleacher project at yep. length that we moved last year and then the security dollars. So that with now the decoupled Latimer project is what is year one. And the only other change as near uh, Neil mentioned that has uh, changed since the workshop. And since our review of the public document is moving the sixth grade to year four. So everything else remains um, as you saw it. Okay. Okay. So, and, and just not to skim over the bleacher project, we talked about how important that was last year that we have a safety issue now at the high school. So I think that's important to note that we, we've been very thoughtful about what we're putting on this plan in year one as we move forward to discussions with the Board of Selectmen and um, eventually we hope to the Board of Finance. So with that, um, I would need a motion. Um, Katie, do you have a slide for the motion? There we go. Can I get a motion on the six-year capital plan? Sure, I'll move that the Board of Education six-year capital improvement plan for the period of 2022 to 2027 be adopted. A second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, I will uh, ask everybody. Yes, I raise my hand for discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. See, this is my problem with this view. I can't see everybody. Yes, go ahead, Sharon. Okay, so just for clarity on discussion, I don't know. Um, I know that we talked about it, Matt, but on the slide that we just showed, we just showed the dollar amount for um, for Latimer. We didn't show the complete dollar amount. For the six year dollar amount, I can read that in. Um, yeah, the full dollar amount for yep. so, on the capital improvement. Let me just go back for a minute, Susan, because I think that's where you were going. We we said the dollar amount for Latimer, and you just mentioned the. I got you. Yeah. But we didn't give all three projects. Yeah. Right. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. Okay. So give me one second. We have $250,000 for uh, district security improvements. And then the other project is the Simsbury High School bleacher and press box, which is 850,000. For a total of? I'd have to add it up. Hold on. 892,406. Right? 3789246. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Okay. 
And just an, of note, the security improvements is something we have on the schedule for every other year. Um, and then, um, as we said, we talked about the bleachers a lot last year and just bringing that back because it does need to be addressed. And I would just say also, just remember that's right. It's a 37 that would, that would appear on the, on the ballot, right? But the number is really whatever that less 8 million, whatever that reimbursement we would get from the state. So um, the, the, so, uh, number, the, the net, yeah, yeah, the net is really less, uh, lower than that. Just, just right. Right. the net to some scenario, I think it was 25 million and yeah. yeah. something. Correct. Yeah. yeah, 12 million yeah. in grants. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now I think, of, is there any other discussion? So now I'm gonna scroll through everybody and see if I missed anyone. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to ask for a vote on the six-year capital improvement as moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much for all the work on this plan. We really do appreciate it. Okay, so now we're on to information and reports. And all that's right. the superintendent's budget. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody. So I do have an opportunity tonight to um, work through at our budget at this point in time. Um, and as you're aware, we've had several budget conversations uh, in a really productive workshop environment on Saturday where we looked at line items and, and you all had a lot of great questions and a lot of thoughts that we've kind of synthesized and have an opportunity to put forward and present to you tonight. So I just want to thank, you know, my kind of administrative team and my program directors for their efforts up to this point, because it's a process behind the scenes that uh, starts in November. And um, they've been very thoughtful in what they've done. I want to also thank Amy Merriweather, our new uh, finance partner with the town, who's really uh, helped us kind of coordinate and organize uh, in very efficient ways. So Amy, thank you for your efforts as well. And I will go ahead and get started with so I did think it was important um, to think about where we are in a point in time, right? This is a different planning process uh, for us administratively, and I think for the board as well, and that we're planning for a budget during this pandemic. And we've talked a lot about all the moving parts, and I think that is a theme of our planning today. So what we went back and did was say, you know, when we went to reopen our schools, we defined guiding principles. And I think these four guiding principles that I have up on the screen uh, are still extremely important as we think about budget planning for next year. You know, the social and emotional health and support uh, of our kids and our staff, access and equity. Uh, we know what an important part of our, our work that has become in our strategic plan. And certainly the health and safety and the instructional models that we have for our kids have never been more important um, than they are now. So I thought it would be good to kind of, from a lens setting and a, a principal setting standpoint, put those, put those back up there to frame our conversation. All right, so the macro numbers to start with, $74,900,804, which is an increase of $2,040,360 over last year's operating cost or a 2.8% increase overall. So the, the presentation tonight um, is split up into three parts. First, we talk about some contextual factors, which I think are important. Uh, because they do have an impact on our planning, do have an impact on our decision making. And then we talk about what we've already heard when we've discussed capital tonight, right? The fiscal reality of where we are, uh, particularly in this challenging time with COVID. But that's got to be balanced with our district vision for continuous improvement, uh, which has been the backbone of our planning mechanism at the board for, for many, many years. And then we'll get into the numbers at the end, the main drivers of the budget, kind of the ups and the downs. Uh, and we'll have an opportunity to answer any questions that uh, that board members have. All right, we can go on to the next one. Perfect. So this is a little bit of, of where we sit in the here and now when we talk about the context that I think is important for us to think about. So as you know, and we've been reporting out almost every meeting, COVID-related expenditures, right? We've, we've taken on additional staff, both certified and non-certified, certainly PPE expenditures, We've enhanced our kind of movement towards one-to-one -to -one technology so we can service our, our students more effectively in this environment. And we've moved to online learning 
uh, almost with the creation of a whole new school at the elementary level. So we've certainly incurred costs uh, that weren't budgeted for as we moved into this year. And we're working really hard to balance that deficit and those costs with federal money from the CARES Act, with dollars that we saved last year during the shutdown that the Board of Finance agreed to let us hold on to in our non-lapsing account. And we've recently put in a freeze that Amy reported out on our last a temporary freeze at our last meeting, uh, really looking at kind of non-essential spending and, and prioritizing things and seeing what we can do to be in the best shape possible in this current year, because that absolutely will impact our planning moving forward. So to date, we're in pretty solid shape and we'll continue to report out to you as we move through the, through the year. I thought in the context of things that this was important information to share. So our process starts early on with the three board meeting. Um, traditionally at the three board meeting, we're provided guidance, both the board of selectmen and the board of education. So we went back and kind of dug through it a little bit. I uh, appreciate Katie for her efforts in that and put together a chart that I think demonstrates that over time, this board is, is really responsible. And historically we do our very best uh, within the parameters we have to meet the targets that are defined uh, by the finance board and, and, and by the community at large. So um, the left-hand column will show you going back to 16, 17, what the, the guidance or the guideline was. And then the board of Edu education budget that was passed um, will give you a little bit of a historical how that ended up. I also included just you know a 10 year average and a five year average of what our operating increases has been think they've been incredibly responsible. We've certainly had the ability to take advantage of the decline in enrollment to limit costs. We've talked about that on an annual basis while we've still been able to create some improvements. But I thought this was a good historical uh, that framed where we are this year because I think we've, we've said from the onset, um, the guidance of 1-5 this year, uh, we understand where it came from in, in terms of, of the planning, uh, but it's certainly as we work through some of our fixed costs, you'll see the challenges uh, that we have before us. I'll move through these next couple ones pretty quick because Neil has uh, had similar slides in front of the board before, but the enrollment is always an important part of our context when we, we plan our budget. So you can see we're planning on an increase of 60 students, uh, but the reality is we're going to be poised to almost look at that as a flat enrollment from a staffing standpoint because of all the moving parts in the decline in enrollment that we saw in the primary grades this year. Um, I think the important um, bullet down below is to think about that flexibility. We've talked a lot about flexibility and adaptability. We'll need to really look carefully at how it shakes out with the primary grades in terms of kindergarten and first grade and what we do with that certified staffing to address the needs and make sure we're staying within our class size guidelines. We just had a great conversation about the capital. Uh, and although the two budgets are separate in the end, uh, they do come together on an annual basis for the taxpayer. Um, so I thought it's important to put up there uh, that yes, we have a large capital ask this year. It's a result of our long-term planning. Uh, and we certainly recognize that we're gonna require significant board uh, and community support to move forward uh, with this top priority of Latimer Lane School. This other piece of the puzzle is just a historic look. And we always talk about enrollment versus uh, FTE, what that looks like over time. Uh, so you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the years that we denote the 2008-9 year, as I know Neil has shared before, is kind of a high water mark in enrollment for us at almost 5,000 students. You can see across uh, horizontally, both the certified staffing number, the non-certified staffing number, the administrative totals, and then the total staffing full-time equivalent numbers. You can see as an enrollment has dropped over time, so have our staffing numbers. Um, the one part, and it's, it's actually off the slide, but I, I'll, I'll bring attention to it. Um, and Neil talked about it in his presentation. We have seen an increase over the past several years in the non-certified staffing in our district that hasn't corresponded with enrollment. Um, and we've, you know, we really want to take a hard look at that this year in our budget planning um, as people retire, as individuals uh, move on to other positions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, the flexibility in the non-certified staffing. 
All right, so this is uh, moving on to that next section on how we try to balance this, this complex soup. So um, the fiscal climate, um, the 1.5% guideline that was given to both boards, um, and we'll continue in our conversation. I know when we meet with the Board of Finance uh, in a couple of weeks to present our budget to them, uh, we talk about mill rate pressure in this community and the desire to either continue to have flat mill rates or minimal mill rate increases. Um, the pandemic impact on both state and local economy. Uh, Jeff talked about that in his, his comments. Tara referenced that in her comments. We need to be cognizant of uh, where we are as a community and where we are as a state uh, with the impact financially. Um, and the state budget uncertainty. Uh, Lydia mentioned early on, the governor's set to come out with his budget. Um, you never know what that's going to look like until we op have the opportunity to see the numbers and and see the language that's put forth. Uh, he has certainly made the statement pretty clearly that he does not plan to cut education in terms of educational cost share or any services or grant money to education. Um, so that's a positive. Um, the recently phased in ECS um, revisions of a couple years ago, we did not see significant declines there. So we're projecting flat ECS money uh, that would go to the town. So those things are positive, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. And then we wanna put forward a budget that really supports our strategic priorities and our guiding beliefs. And I believe this budget does. This budget also uh, increases shared services with the town. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Um, personalized learning opportunities, I believe are what separates our district schools, particularly our high school with the elective offerings. We're protecting those in this budget and we'll budget to our class size guidelines. The last two points are important ones and have been a focal point of our budget conversations moving forward. That's access and equity uh, to either technology, to programs and to intervention models are gonna be extremely important moving forward. And then the social and emotional support of our kids. So you can kind of see the tension between these two. And that's what we try to do every year is put forward a responsible number uh, that supports these, these beliefs of both our board and the administration. Okay, so this is this is a slide actually, I'll give Neil credit for this one that he put together that I think really demonstrates the need for us to be flexible in our planning process, but also uh, demonstrates how coming out of one budget and moving into the reality of the COVID pandemic, we've created almost a very different system to structure under. Um, and our primary goal as we enter uh, more normalcy in, in the fall will be to ensure that we have rebuilt our robust intervention programs. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, during my tenure as superintendent, this board has really taken a strong stand in advocating for student needs, advocating for strong professionals to provide those interventions and strong systems to support those interventions. And what we've done in this current year is take those very people, our math coaches, our language arts consultants, our intervention uh, specialists, and they are in reassignments to either work with distance learning sections or in sections as classroom teachers this year. Uh, and I think it's an opportunity here, um, although this is a budget presentation to really thank uh, those staff members for their ability to be flexible and adaptable because we changed the course of what they were walking into in terms of job function and we did it because it was best for kids. Um, yeah, so we certainly appreciate all your efforts, but also wanna say, at the top of our priority list is to reinstitute those very positions. But you can see between the two, it's, it's 21 positions that need to be repurposed um, back to where they were before uh, in order for us to receive our students back into the school system. So really an important part of understanding not only where we are budgetarily, but where we are in our planning as a school district. All right, so this last section, it's, it's pretty quick. I tried to uh, consolidate the numbers and the, and the themes and, and boil them down to the biggest pieces. When it comes down to it, um, our operating costs um, really are people and benefits. It's over 80%, uh, we're a people business. We talk about that a lot. 80% um, of our dollars come from staffing and they come from our insurance and our pension obligations. So we're gonna work through some of those main drivers uh, this evening, and then we can, we'll open it up for questions. So the personnel drivers, um, as you can see, I think I've got my little split screen in the way here, so let me move that over. 
um, the impact of our teacher negotiated contracts. So this slide is like a rollover, right? This is taking our contracts, moving them forward into what they would be next year as we meet our obligations that were negotiated. Um, so you can see our teachers contract, which obviously is our largest group, uh, over 300 employees is a 1.81% increase over operating costs from last year. Um, the next line item is the uh, impact of our administrative staff. You can see there we're citing a, a reduction of over 100,000. And that really comes from uh, when we re, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, we restructured our central office with Aaron's retirement, with Burke's retirement, and with the commitment to the shared service model uh, with Amy Merriweather. So we do receive, uh, see some pretty significant savings there. Um, and also think we've got a model that really meets the needs of our district. You can see the nurses contract, the custodial contract, and then the dollar figure that we keep in reserves um, for the unaffiliated and the contracts that still need to be um, settled. So overall, in terms of looking at, at the value over operating last year, it's 1.5 million or a little bit over 2%. So when I talked about the challenge of the 1.5% increase, guideline, the reality is just in individuals alone with contracts that have been negotiated and committed, we're at a 2% increase. This insurance slide I took right from the workshop and really demonstrates to you what the actual insurance costs in our operating budget were uh, in fiscal year 20, um, what we project for this year, and then what we're projecting for the year after. So this is the second largest driver uh, in our operating budget, and we project to have close to a $17 million line item in the insurance number. Uh, we've listed some of the factors that we went over at the workshop in terms of uh, increased administrative fees and, and stop loss insurance. Uh, important point in terms of the state of reserves, uh, and I'll, I'll speak to this on the last slide in the presentation. Um, our reserves in our self-insurance fund are in a very good uh, place. Amy's in conversation with Lockton and with the town on the potential for us to use some of those reserve levels to lower uh, the 7% increase that we have in the operating budget now. But right now as a placeholder, we have in a 7% increase, which is an overall increase in operating over last year of So as we work through the planning process and we met with our principals, with our program directors, there were areas where we were able to uh, take a look and say, we can be more efficient here. We think we can uh, save some dollars in the long run. And then one is really taking a hard look at that non-certified staffing uh, level. As we've talked about in Neil's presentation and in subsequent conversations, that's a number that has increased uh, pretty significantly over time when our enrollment has not increased. So just really going back and taking a look at the, the functions, um, what individuals are server, serving what students, what retirements are coming up, um, what jobs uh, people are leaving. And we usually see some rollover in these non-certified positions. So this will be a focal part of uh, our planning in the spring, but we're committing to a reduction of five non-certified staffing positions, um, which will have a, a net impact of $300,000. Um, also, the staff retirements, we have six known staff retirements. This number could increase over time as, a, as we continue the planning process for the budget. But uh, as you're familiar with, what we do is we take the, uh, for budgeting purposes, the outgoing high-end salary, um, and we, we put plug in a middle level higher just as an estimate, and $25,000 in savings for each of those positions. Um, so that's another $150,000 in savings. Um, I talked a little bit about the administrative uh, restructure that saves us a little over $100,000 and then some smaller savings in these two other equipments that are really, for us, zero-based budget accounts. Principals and program leaders come on an annual basis, talk about what their needs are. We review, we reprioritize, and we're able to save um, not huge dollars, um, but all these dollars help in um, supplies. Um, and in equipment as well. So those are really the efficiency areas that we're looking at at this point in this year's budget. And from a more thematic uh, standpoint, just to summarize where we are, we have one new request 
for a position. We've had really good conversation about this. It's a director of equity and access. Uh, we feel it's a position that aligns very well with the district priorities and the strategic plan that this board supported two years ago. Um, this is a position that will help us uh, with quality leadership in the area of professional development, curriculum review, staff and student engagement. This is an individual that I think will work very well as a community liaison uh, with the Spirit Council on the town side and the work that they have going on with equity as well. Um, but most of all, it's a piece of the puzzle that we talked about with the board with our restructure. Uh, in, Sue, in Sue Lemke uh, taking on a new role as the Director of Teaching and Learning and underneath her, the position of Director of Pupil Services, which we just appointed tonight, the Director of Elementary Curriculum, which is Betsy Gonzalez's position. And then this would be a new position as a Director of Equity and Access that I think would round out um, really the priorities of the school district and allow us to move forward, uh, I think in a more productive and, and, and a higher level and a more balanced level in terms of who is moving the work and who is leading the work in the district. Um, you see a few bullets on the central office restructuring. I've touched on a few of them before, um, but certainly the shared service uh, agreement with the town. This is something that we have explored over many years. And I think we have several areas um, where we do a nice job sharing resources with the town, certainly our SROs. Um, there's maintenance uh, in terms of our field maintenance and other areas, uh, computer techs. Um, but this is really a, a high level position that now we have a common voice across uh, both boards um, that we're excited about. Um, and I think also, you know, you know, is more efficient in terms of the dollars and cents when he analyzed that. So that's a, that's a good piece for us. Um, as a district and as a town to be moving forward with. And then on the non-certified staffing side, I just covered that. So I don't wanna redo the whole thing, but we're committed to looking at that non-certified staffing. So also I just wanna hit on what are the program enhancements in this budget? Because that's really the, the balancing act. And really it's about providing uh, intervention supports and rebuilding those supports as we move forward. So we are gonna be putting into place over the summer, some robust programming at the secondary level and at the elementary level uh, to meet the needs of our students as we assess gaps and we find out where our students are. What's nice about these two items is they're gonna be budget neutral this year. They're gonna be budget neutral because we've just received uh, more federal dollars, a little over $400,000 in uh, a second round of the ESRA funding that they call it, and we will be able to apply those costs to that grant funding. And I know we're gonna be coming forward uh, at the next board meeting with a little bit more of a detailed presentation to the board about some of these intervention programs that are currently going on now, and some of the, the plans of, of what the build outs are gonna look like in the future. Uh, I've talked about the Director of Equity and Inclusion um, that, that we're very excited about. Um, again, we plan to reinstitute the reading intervention model at the elementary uh, school level. That's budget neutral, but extremely important in our ability to meet the student needs. Um, we've escalated that access to the one-to-one -one ratio as a result or a byproduct of the online learning. Um, we're gonna have that and continue to fund that in a replacement plan moving forward. Um, reinstitute our math coaching staff and reinstitute our language arts consultants and staff members. So those are positions um, where there are a few vacancies at this point, um, where we fired temporary teachers. For example, we had a math coach that left. Um, she was going to teach distance learning, left to take an administrative job. We filled that with a temporary teaching position, but we feel it's very important that we don't reduce that staff or take that opportunity right now. We use it to reinstitute our, our math coaching staff at the elementary level. So those are really uh, the focal points of our improvements and enhancements. Um, in this budget. So this print gets a little small, but this is the wrap on how it all comes together. And I know this is a, a format we really stay consistent and true to as we talk about across the, the multiple boards. So I won't hit every line item. I'll ex explain the macro of it because I've hit all these pieces in the, the presentation this evening. Uh, but the upper part of the chart are the additions. They're the contract values. Um, 
They're the new position request in the equity position. Uh, and they're really the insurance dollars that we're rolling forward. Uh, so all said and done, the additions in cost this year are 2.5 million or three and a half percent. And then we look what comes off that at this point. And those are the certified staffing retirements. Those are the reductions in non-certified staffing and other smaller line item decreases that we've gone through after all the ups and downs uh, in the line item budget that we talked about. Uh, so total reductions of a little over a half a million. And that's where we got back to where we started in the first slide of the presentation, uh, an increase of a little over $2 million or 2.8% of the operating costs. So this is, this is an important piece of the puzzle, the remaining unknowns. So we have a couple weeks until our next board meeting and this information will evolve. Um, and these are some of the things that, that continue to be on the table as we work through the budget process. One is the pension assumption rate. This is an annual conversation uh, that the Board of Ed is driven in terms of looking at the rate of return for the investments that fund our pension plan um, and trying to make that rate a little more uh, accurate over time. I think we made an adjustment. Uh, I don't know if we made one last year, but maybe the year before. Uh, and I know that'll be up for conversation this year. They talked about it um, in the three board meeting. What we'll have to see, and I, and I believe that uh, Rob Pomeroy, the chairman of the, the Board of Finance, did state this at the three board meeting, that if they make that assumption, uh, it will not be put into our operating costs this year, that they would try to utilize reserves or another way so it wouldn't increase the cost. Um, but I'm not certain on that. And that's part of the conversation normally um, when we get together at that uh, public hearing or town meeting. Um, the insurance premium, um, I had talked about the, the healthy level of reserves in our internal service fund. Uh, we expect to be able to come back to this board on the 23rd with a uh, revised insurance premium number. Uh, I can't talk about tonight. I don't know the extent of what that decrease will be, but I think it'll have uh, a positive inf impact on our budget and allow us a little bit more flexibility uh, in limiting the increase. And then we'd also like to come back to the board on the 23rd with a little more detail on how we plan to use the $430,000 um, that are coming to the district that we just found out about uh, last week. Uh, we may have an opportunity to use some of those dollars to offset technology dollars that are in the operating budget. Um, and again, have a positive impact, but need a little more time to work through that uh, and come back to the board. So those are some remaining unknowns um, that I feel pretty good about that I think will give uh, you some more uh, flexibility in decision making and it ultimately allow us to uh, lower that 2.8% increase a little bit. And then the last piece of the puzzle um, is the non-public budget. Um, certainly doesn't get as much uh, conversation because of the overall number. It's a number uh, of a little over half million, $564,650. Uh, we're increasing that budget 2.3 percent or $12,000. So what that budget constitutes essentially is our nurse, nursing and health staff to our private schools. We're responsible by statute to provide that staffing. Transportation costs to our private schools. That's a responsibility of the public school system. And then we have uh, field maintenance numbers in there and some park and recreation dollars, uh, overtime expenditures and things like that from joint ventures with the town um, that aren't in our overall operating budget. So a small number, but one nonetheless that we always put out in public and, and speak through as well. So the, ne the next steps in this process, we come back on the 23rd. As we said, we'll have a little more information for you, particularly on the insurance front and the, uh, the federal money. Uh, but the 23rd is the, the date for you to really kind of go through, uh, make any statements that you have about the budget, ask any final questions that you'd like to ask of our administration. So we'll certainly be prepared to answer those. Um, but you vote on the, the public and non-public budgets on the 23rd. We then move our for, uh, budget forward on March 9th to the finance board. Uh, we present what's usually a, a pulled down version of, of this PowerPoint stack, but then have uh, a Q&A with them to answer any questions that they have. And then uh, as it stands now, there's an April 6th Board of Finance public hearing on both the capital and the operating budget. So in terms of our next steps 
in the operating budget, uh, this is what it looks like. And I can, or my team can answer any questions that you have um, on that presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so why don't we just open it up if anybody has questions for Matt or anybody else at this point. No, I'll uh, just thank Matt for that. The recap was great. And, um, a lot of stuff that we've talked about over the past few weeks and months, and that was uh, a nice uh, consolidation of all of the items that we've talked about. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, well, I think everyone should probably weigh in a little bit on, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, we've been working on this for a long time and a lot of these details um, have been hashed out and a lot of things have, we've been asking for a lot of details. Um, I think the most important thing that I saw on this was the absolute um, responsibility we are taking on making sure that as we go back in from COVID that we are trying to get all of those support systems in place for our students for summer school and for um, transition into the fall and any of the gaps we're, we're, we're seeing that we don't even know are there yet. I think um, we're trying to be very careful to make sure that that is covered and taken care of. Um, and I, I think it's just really hard. There's a lot of need and a lot of, um, I think everything that we have on our budget are things that absolutely affect our students as always. It's, it's just, it's, um, I, I, good budget and I, I feel good about it. Thank you. Awesome. I agree. This is a very well thought out budget budget process. We had a, a very good um, budget workshop uh, last Saturday where we did get into the uh, into the weeds of some areas and, and the minutiae of some things in order to present this tonight. But, um, you know, kudos to you, Matt, and to the staff and to the building principals and all those that started this process back in November to bring it to the fruition where we are now in February. So um, I think it's a great, I think it's a very good budget. I think it's a good budget that um, needs to go forward and, um, you know, presented to, to Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. Anyone else? I would, I would just. Go ahead. I was I was just going to reiterate, you know, what everyone else said is that the Saturday meeting I thought was great and informative. I think that everyone did a great job um, pulling together what's critical. I mean, my main concern has always been, you know, those kids coming back next year, what it looks like and to cut any deeper. I just don't I, I don't see how that's possible. I think that this is a great um, budget to move forward based on, you know, those needs that we don't even know what's going to be there next year. And so I'm, I'm thankful and thanks Matt and everybody um, for putting this forward. Sharon, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I agree. I'm appreciative of the session that we had on Saturday. Um, and as we discussed and as Matt has also um, alluded to, you know, I'm looking for the additional information that we're going to have coming forward to, to um, continue to, um, you know, affirm what we've shown here um, that will hopefully continue to show the need for what we've expressed here. Um, it's the additional detail that will help us to understand some of the needs that are showing up in the schools. Um, I think this has given us a high level, um, but I think there's some additional detail that I, you know, I'm also wanting to see. Susan, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, first off, thank Matt and his entire team. Um, I think it's a responsible budget. And I think it's, you know, given the situation where we're at, like, like Jen said, for me personally, and you know, I don't speak for everyone, but the focus has to be on the kids. And I think this is fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, if I could just echo really what everybody's saying, um, 
just thanks to the team for putting this together. I, I think it's a, a responsible budget. And I just, I just think about the, the letter, quite honestly, that, that Jen read tonight. We heard a, a, a very um, real concern about our students falling behind. And what, to me, I translate that into added importance uh, to these math coaches and these, you know, the, the, the function that, that the, those roles are playing is only going to grow uh, in the next year. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it, it is, it is critically important. Um, and I just don't know how much, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's responsible to, to be cutting anymore. I think this it meets the needs of the town and uh, I just, you know, hats off and appreciate the, the discussion. And I, and I just want to make the point that um, we've been talking about a director of equity position for two years, and I'm glad to see that we've found, a, we've put it into the budget this year, because I think that's something that um, really helps us move the work forward that we've all said we are passionate about, that we want to see this district forward together, and having a point person handle that, I think we've all agreed is really important. So I just want to point out that this is something that we have we have discussed for a while. This is not um, it's not something we're doing lightly. We've been working toward this, and the work is getting done. And we're at a point now where having somebody who can head that work up is is vital. Um, and my only comment was uh, in Matt's budget when he talked about program enhancements and and the interventions we're going to have over the summer elementary level and at the high school, we don't want Henry James to think we forgot about them. And, and that was part of our conversation on Saturday as well. Um, Susan, I just, I just want to jump in on, on that point. And I think it, it's to the, the point Sharon made as well. And I just want to be clear with people on the 23rd, when we come back, um, we're going to provide that level of detail. I do think it's important both to the board and uh, public to, to see what we're thinking about in these structures for intervention um, and some of the thoughts on, on, on what this performance and what some of these gaps may look like. It's a really important conversation. I know it's at the forefront of everybody's mind. Thank you, Matt. Hey, Susan, can I just say real, real briefly, you know, sure. tonight we've talked about a lot of money, right? A big ticket items between the capital improvement and the budget. I just want folks at home to know that, you know, we're just not eight members of a board. I just, we, we live in the community. We will have to, we personally will have to live financially with these, the impacts as well. So, you know, we, we wrestle with these same questions that, that you at home are as well. And again, I, I, I just, just want to make sure everybody realizes that, that we feel these impacts uh, just as much as anybody. All right. We're all taxpayers here. Exactly. And um, not all of us have kids in school. Mm -hmm. We're kind of across the board. We really do. <laughs> represent the spectrum of the town yep. so um so we 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 know what we're asking mm -hmm. i guess is the bottom line right jeff yeah absolutely thank you okay anything else on the budget all right then we are on to policy great i will jump in here susan we've been at it for a while tonight so i'll try to be brief um the policy committee met a few weekends ago for a um, morning meeting to um, put forward a few policies that needed um, action. Uh, the first is our um, visitors to school building policy. Um, this is a necessary revision um, due to the fact that in last year's budget, we purchased a new visitor management system known um, as the Raptor system. Um, it's a, a system that a visitor to um, right now, we're going to pilot it at Simsbury High School. Um, a, a visitor to the school building would re be required to give a driver's license or a picture ID that would then be scanned. Um, it actually runs through the sexual offender public database, but also importantly, pr prints a badge that the person would wear identifying who they are and where they should be. We had not moved this policy forward in the fall, um, mostly because our um, visitors have dwindled to almost zero under COVID conditions. 
but we did purchase this system. We wanted to implement at least for a few months this spring. And this is a revision to the policy saying that visitors to the building are subject to compliance with that um, procedure. It's a procedure, the Raptor system has been used in, it is being used in thousands of school districts across the country. Locally, we have consulted with both West Hartford and Canton who currently use the system. Um, and this is an appropriate revision to the policy. Um, policy 4100 was reviewed. It's a very brief um, organizational chart, really. This reflects the changes that Matt addressed uh, related to our central office structure and some of the new director's positions. And quite frankly, is just a minor revision of the organizational chart under our new assistant superintendent structures. The needy policies that we have to deal with are really, they go hand in hand. 4,209 is a um, personnel or employee policy um, and 5145.51 is a student policy, but they both directly relate to new Title IX regulations that were passed um, that went really under the radar um, because they were passed uh, by the Department of Education um, last spring. So as all of us were heading into stay at home orders and quarantines, um, there was a pretty significant revision um, to Title IX regulations. And um, as a result, what we're, we're responding to here is federal changes. This was this was all um, done at the national level. Um, if you are a follower of the news, you may have read about this or heard about it on the news as sort of the rollback of Obama era guidelines. Um, I will say um, politically, that really had to do with higher education. It was about um, what was going on in college environments related to Title IX cases. But once they changed Title IX law, it had a pretty significant impact on the procedures if you do get a Title IX complaint at the K-12 K level. So what this did was take our sexual harassment policies. We worked with an attorney at Shipman and Goodwin to not only revise these policies to meet the new federal regulations, but also to do a three hour training with all of our administrators so that we are now um, up to speed. So um, what this is um, creating is far more procedural safeguards related to Title IX complaints that might come forward. It still does allow complaints to be um, handled on a more informal level if that's the wish of the parties. But if the parties do decide to proceed um, to a formal uh, sexual harassment or sexual discrimination complaint, there are now pretty significant legal procedures that we would need to go through that are reflected throughout this very lengthy set of policies. You don't really have a choice about these policies. They're federal law. And we just did the update to make sure that we are now in um, alignment with that. Again, completely done with the partnership of Shipman and Goodwin, so they meet all the legal standards. So that was what we needed to bring forward at this time. This process works in such a way that it goes through the policy committee for that full vetting. This today would be what we call the first reading. Um, at our meeting two weeks from now, we'll do a second reading. If anybody has questions between now and then, they should reach out to me and I can help talk through any questions board members um, might have. Um, and we can maybe handle those offline, but I'm happy to take questions in public at the next meeting too. And then the vote would come at the next meeting after the 23rd to accept these policies. So um, I'll pause there. All right, so I think that meeting would probably be the second meeting in March because we have our presentation to the Board of Finance at the beginning of March. Correct. Okay, okay. Any questions for Neil on this? Um, all the policies were emailed, so you can all- It's a lot easier to read them with the changes in them. It's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. 
So please make sure you check your email and go through that. Um, so with we are back to public audience again, um, and we've read all our letters in. So uh, we do thank everybody for reaching out to us and letting us know your concerns. Uh, we do like to hear from everybody. And uh, our next meeting is going to be Tuesday, February 23rd. We are on the road. We are at Squadron Line. Um, so we look forward to being at Squadron Line School and hope that some of our Squadron Line families will come out and see us. And um, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night.